Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Kimberly Bethany Benora. In this series, we'll be practicing yoga and exercise, breath and meditation, stress management, and self-care. You can find me on the web at www.drkimberlybenora.com and on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Dr. Kimberly Benora. Remember, if you like these videos, please like and subscribe. By continuing with the video, you, the viewer, are agreeing to and accepting the terms of the following waiver of liability. You acknowledge the following. I understand that the materials provided, including yoga and meditation, include physical activity. And as with all physical activity, there is the risk of injury of varying types and degrees, which risk cannot be entirely eliminated. If I experience any pain or discomfort, I agree that I will discontinue the activity. I assume full responsibility for any and all damages which may be incurred as a result of my watching and or participating in this video. I understand that the materials provided, including yoga and meditation, are not a substitute for medical attention, examination, diagnosis, or treatment, nor are they recommended or safe under certain medical conditions. I understand that I am advised to have a physician verify the status of my health and physical condition as sufficient to allow me to participate in the activities provided by the program. I also affirm that I alone am responsible to decide whether to practice with this video and my participation is at my own risk. I agree to irrevocably release and waive any claims that I have now or may have hereafter against Kimberly Bethany Benora LLC and its instructors, content creators, and any employees or affiliates. I have read and fully understand and agree to the above terms of this liability waiver agreement. I understand that my watching of this video serves as my consent to this waiver and to complete an unconditional release of all liability to the greatest extent allowed by law. This recipient is the dissertation award recipient. And uh, Kimberly Benura, she said I could get this pronunciation incorrect. It took her until after she was uh, engaged to finally get it right. <laughs> so I think I was close. <laughs> Thank you. Um, did her undergraduate degree at uh, Thomas Edison State College in New Jersey. She did her master's degree and PhD at Florida State. Her thesis was done with uh, David Hardman, and she, we emailed back uh, and forth about what I might want to say. She spoke very, very kindly and fondly about his contributions, not only with, for, on her thesis, but also on her dissertation serving on her committee. He's retired and has contributed to many theses and dissertations throughout his career. Uh, and so she's along that training of uh, training, uh, so to speak. Um, her PhD was done under the direction of Gershon Tenenbaum, who uh, is, again, another international leader in sports psychology. And her passion is yoga, as you'll see. And she presents her dissertation topic today. She's been practicing yoga for 19 years, and she's been instructing for 10 years. And uh, looking at her Vita, she's got every certification and everything that says yoga all the way. Just reading her uh, uh, Vita gave me that. It's really uh, very yoga focused. Here. We've got passion here, uh, clearly, and I, and, I, and I commend you for that. Uh, and she's brought it to a really unbelievably high quality level in terms of empirical data, which is really, really nice to see in our discipline, some evidence-based uh, research showing that this practice has these effects and for these reasons, and I'm sure we're going to see that. She's published uh, an article, book, chapter, numerous presentations. Uh, she is currently Assistant Director of the Center for Teaching Excellence uh, at, the, at the United States Military Academy and also an Assistant Professor. Uh, she is our recipient of the uh, 2008 APA Division 47 Dissertation Award. The title of her dissertation is The Impact of Yoga on Psychological Health in Older Adults. Dr. Kimberly Bonnaroo. Bonnaroo. <laughs> So again, the impact of yoga on psychological health in older adults. 
my major professor from the Scourge and Tenenbaum, who apologizes for not being here. He is actually on the plane at this moment, so he said he would be thinking of us from the air. Um, my committee members, Dr. Neil Sharnas, who is here with us right now, Dr. Robert Eklund, Dr. F. Donald Kelly, and Dr. David Parkman, who stayed on even after his retirement to finish me out. And I defended this last April at Florida State University. Um, I want to start by saying thank you, of course, to Division 47 for this wonderful honor, and of course to my major professor, all of my committee members, and my mother and my husband, who's here with us, and my mom will be watching the, the video after, afterwards. Um, like Dr. Murphy said, you can't do it without external support, and the committee members and my family were a huge part of what allowed me to finish this and, and have a product that I feel pretty proud of. Um, I'd also like to start a little non-traditionally by giving a small apology. I had an emergency surgery on Tuesday, so I'm on morphine right now. My doctor really didn't want me to travel, but I explained that this was a really big deal in my career, and I promised that my husband would do all the driving and luggage carrying, so I'm here on those two qualifications. Um, so if my questions or my statistics don't make sense today, ask me in a week when I'm off the morphine, and I'll, I promise they will. One of the questions that I always find most interesting about research is the why. Why does somebody go into something? Why does something become an interesting research topic? And for me, um, I've been doing yoga a very long time, and at some point along the way, I was teaching yoga in fitness centers and, and community centers, and noticed that the one population that yoga didn't often reach was an older adult population. A lot of yoga is on the floor. You're sitting in cross-legged positions. You're doing inversions and, and things like that. And if you've been doing yoga your whole life, there are certainly older adults who still do that stuff. There's a, an amazing traditional yoga teacher named Indra Devi who, at 100, was still teaching yoga every day and doing headstands and shoulder stands. And when she would fly on airplanes, she'd do headstands in the aisle, you know, in the middle of the night to get her energy going. But that's somebody who'd been doing it since they were very young. Starting yoga when you're older is a different experience because you've got a lifetime of knees and backs and hips and those sorts of things. So I started playing around with my yoga and using my mom, who's a retired army officer, disabled vet, as kind of my guinea pig, and started developing yoga that was a little more accessible for people who hadn't done it before. Um, these are some of my students at a senior center, and they, they did give me consent to take these pictures. But So as you can see, we do it with chairs, and when we do balanced stuff, they're holding onto the side of the chair if they need to, and if they don't need to, they don't, but they've got it there. We're sitting in chairs for the meditation part for, instead of sitting on the floor. So it's much, much more accessible. And I've been teaching yoga to seniors in a chair-based format for a long time. And what I always heard from my seniors was what a difference it made in their lives. How much they felt better, how they felt less stressed, how they felt less anxious, how they felt more independent. Some of the older women said that they were able to get through church without having to run to the bathroom. They were actually able to get all the way through the, through the, the service or they could get to the grocery store and put their own groceries in the cart and get home and actually reach the top shelf to put things away. So I heard a lot about how it seemed to make quality of life better. And when I got to graduate school, I was very fortunate that when I started talking about those things to the people that would end up on my committee, they were also interested in it and were supportive of me pursuing this research avenue to see if what I'd seen anecdotally for several years also came up as being valid in the research. Um, looking at the, the literature, we know that there is older adult use of yoga. About 17% of individuals over the age of 50 have tried yoga, and about 16% of yoga practitioners who practice on a regular basis are over the age of 54, so there is a trend. We've also seen the benefits of exercise in general for older adults. Net et al. Uh, Nets et al. did a, a, a substantial meta-analysis that showed that exercise has a positive impact on psychological health. And I wanted to see if yoga had a greater impact than just exercise itself. Um, from a philosophical perspective, yoga should, because while it is exercise, it also brings in self-control training, breathing training, some philosophy of self-awareness and focus and those sorts of things. So you've got the physical exercise, but you also have a psychological training component. And I feel and felt when I began that self-control was probably a part of what creates yoga's impact not just exercise, it's learning to control your mind, to control your thoughts, to control how you perceive the world. So my purpose was to identify the impact of yoga on psychological health in older adults and investigate self-control as the potential underlying mechanism. I had 
98 participants. Uh, I started with 104, but I lost a couple due to other issues. One of them fell. They moved to another, moved from an assisted living facility to a full nursing home. I worked in two centers in order to get enough people to meet my power requirements. An assisted living facility where they lived independently but had support in terms of cooking, cleaning, driving, and then a community senior center where they came on a daily basis from their own homes for lunch activities, those sorts of things. Predominantly females, as often happens in older adult research, um, mostly retired, mostly widowed. They did tend to report that they exercised before the intervention started that tended to be at walking. They said they walked to the cafeteria, they walked around the facility, they walked in their neighborhood to get their mail, those sorts of things. And cumulatively, <coughs> they had a lot of walking in their daily life before we started. I did a chair yoga intervention and a chair exercise intervention so I could compare the difference between just doing exercise and exercise with the mindful component. And we also did a no treatment control group. They were waitlisted just to get a sense of what would have happened over time. <coughs> Looking at the chair yoga versus the chair exercise, I tried to make the exercise sessions as equivalent as possible in terms of physical activity so that the main difference was the people doing chair yoga were getting instruction on breathing and focusing the people in the exercise were just getting the exercise instructions. But they were doing essentially the same stuff during the class. Um, the big contrast is also that at the end there, the last 10 minutes of the yoga session was actually some meditation and pranayama, which is breathing exercise. And the exercise class was doing just some cool down stretches and things like that. But again, things that were equivalent and parallel to the exercises being done in the chair yoga class. It was a six week intervention. 45 minute, one 45 minute class each week, plus every week they received guidance about a 15 minute routine that they were supposed to practice on their own, because yoga is about both individual and guided practice to develop that independence and that self-control. And we did each week ask them how many times they practiced, so we tracked attendance, we tracked individual practice. Um, in an ideal world, it would have been a lot more people in a much longer study, but this was an unfunded dissertation, so you do the best you can. And you know, someday when I get my huge yoga grant from NIH, we'll just have thousands of participants for years or something like that. Um, when we looked at the main analysis, sorry that yellow didn't turn out very well, you can see that the yoga groups um, all improved from pre-test to post-test and from post-test to follow-up. And those were statistically significant. Yoga versus exercise and yoga versus control, all of those contrasts were statistically significant showing greater improvement through the yoga groups um, and again if anybody is interested I have my email at the end I can send you the specific data and all that if you want to see the very specific numbers of the effect sizes the other thing we did was some some pre-test post-test by session we did state anger and state anxiety for the first session the middle session and the final session and we saw that there was a trend that both an improvement you know, from the beginning of a session to the end of the session, but also over the course of the intervention, the yoga participants tended to show greater improvement in reducing both state anger and state anxiety. So you show cumulative effects and immediate effects from the intervention. Of course, the exercise people also improved, but not as much as the yoga individuals. We also showed um, self-control, and the yoga individuals did increase more in self-control than the other groups. And we ran correlations, but we also did a general linear model, and there was a predictive um, component that self-control changes, predicted changes in the psychological variables. So it does seem like there's some potential explanation that yoga teaches self-control, which then helps impact other psychological variables, and that is something that I'd like to look at more in depth with later research. Um, summing it all up, yoga and exercise both improved psychological health, but the effect sizes for the impact of yoga were larger and those differences were statistically significant. Yoga showed immediate improvements in mood. Self-control does seem to be a mechanism. However, when, after you take all of this, there's still a need for a much more holistic explanation, pulling in yoga's philosophy, yoga's theories, because it is more than just exercise. And that's one of the things that the literature out there says is we need to understand on a much more holistic, deeper level why yoga works the way it does. And that's certainly where I'd like to move forward with my, my research direction and my um, research focus as I continue my career beyond this point. Um, for me, the big so what question at the end is always the exciting thing. And again, these are some more of my seniors. The guy in the middle, um, 
these are these are not from my these are not my research participants. These were from a free class that I did at Tallahassee while I was going to graduate school. The guy in the middle is a retired vet, and he hadn't been doing exercise at all. And this class that I did at the senior center, we used to do in the cafeteria the hour before lunch. And the benefit of that is, is my regulars came just for yoga class. The people who had never done yoga and never thought about doing yoga would come in, they'd get their coffee, they'd start chatting, they'd see me up at the front, and they'd say, well, what's she doing? And sometimes I could kind of pull them in. And he was one of the pull-in people. He'd come in for coffee one day about a half hour earlier, and at the end he said that, um, you know, you see a, a young female up at the front of the senior center, you wonder why she's there, so he, my attention, his attention got drawn and he started doing yoga with me and he became a regular and actually had a, a much improved um, functional independence from doing yoga because he, not only that he became more physically able, but he became more confident, he became more comfortable in doing things and he started going to other cherry exercise classes as well at the senior center. So there is that self-confidence that builds. There was another gentleman who was always in his wheelchair and by the end of um, a couple of months of yoga practice, he was moving to regular chairs and he was actually standing up for some of the exercise. And so you see that kind of build in independence. I do think as we look at future directions, it's important to look at how yoga can be applied um, for seniors and for older adults, there's, there's certainly the capacity that, that it's, it's a low-cost intervention. You can apply it with larger groups of people. You can take it into a senior center. So it's, it's certainly a very affordable way to provide preventative health care for older adults. But if we're going to do that, it's very important to have clear guidelines about how to do that safely, how to do that so that you don't have injuries, how to do that in a way that doesn't have contraindication for other medical treatments and other interventions, which I think is very important then um, for there to be CAM education from complementary and alternative medicine education for medical professionals. The research shows that not a lot of doctors actually understand how yoga and other CAM methods work, and their patients, therefore, may not talk to them about what they're doing, and that could be counterindicated for long-term health. So I think it's important both for the population in general and for the medical population to have a better understanding of how these complementary and alternative medicine treatments work what places they're good for, what things they're not good for. Certainly good for general stress, um, low back pain, certain things like that. But there are issues like certain eye diseases where yoga, because of the pressure related to controlled breathing and all that, might be counterindicated. So it's very, that education is very, very important. And, okay, questions? Yes,
modern medical journal that's in you know every medical library. So I spent a lot of time at the FSU Medical Library getting <coughs> a great deal of stuff from them. The yoga literature at this point is not great. There's a lot of it that is empirically flawed. Um, that you know methodological problems, not enough power, not enough people, not not enough detail for replication. Um, only reporting positive effects instead of negative effects. You don't really see the full body of what the research looks like. So yes, it was a difficult process, both getting stuff and then sorting through it to try to make sense of it and to not have a, well, I do yoga, so I believe in it, predisposition, but to really look at it you know, from a, an objective scientific perspective. Yes, I, I spent a long time on the lit review. Yes? I mean, one of the most interesting things is you actually got some differences between the exercise, obviously, and yoga. If, uh, what would your advice be to somebody who's maybe an exercise uh, trainer or physical fitness about what could they add to an exercise program that might mimic some of the benefits that you think uh, come from yoga? Well, certainly from a theoretical perspective, adding mindfulness training, some, some mental training in terms of focusing, self-control, awareness should bring in some of those benefits. From a traditional yoga perspective, the, the philosophy would say there's nothing you can do to make exercise yoga because yoga is qualitatively different. But that that's moving into a more spiritual, philosophical perspective. So from, from the purely um, psychological components aspect, if we added in focusing training, mental awareness, awareness of breathing, not just inhale, exhale, but thinking about your breathing, controlled breathing, a lot of the things that we already do in sports psychology and mental training, that would make exercise a more mindful and mentally controlled process, which should bring in some of those additional benefits. Yes. Would you consider adding a fourth group that just did those activities and no exercise. Yes. And what do you think would happen? There are actually some yoga studies because there's at, at this point there are 104 different registered styles of yoga with, with Yoga Alliance, which is the organizing body of yoga teachers. It, 50 years ago there was just yoga, and now there's 104 different styles. And some styles of yoga really do focus just on the breathing and the meditation. And there are a few studies that use um, those types of yoga and have found benefits based on that. One study looked at ADHD and found using meditation and breathing, so just the pranayama and the meditation, they found benefits for ADHD. Another study found just using meditation and pranayama benefits for um, depression and, and anxiety. So there are there is the capacity for just the psychological component of yoga to be beneficial as well, absolutely. My, my proposition, though, was that yoga, which brings both the exercising and the psychological control, is where you're going to see the most benefits. But yes, in a future study, that would be a great addition to really compare. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Well, let me uh, give some plaques out. I forgot to do that for our first one. Thank you. surgery. I feel like I'm the one who dragged her here. <laughs> I've been emailing her and saying, don't forget this, how about this? And I'm, but I'm delighted that you came and you did a great job and I need whatever you're taking. I think. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, we have this plaque. Thank you so much. You did a great job. Uh, I hate to say that we also have a cash board with this and the checks in the mail. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. of gratitude to my amazing team. Thank you for being part of the Kimberly Bethany Benora LLC production crew. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm Kimberly Bethany Benora. You can find me on the web at www.drkimberlybenora.com. You can find me on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Dr. Kimberly Benora. If you like my videos, please like and subscribe.